Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's March the 24th, 2021. It's time for only one thing, and that's What Now America? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Welcome. And uh, today's title is Migration Headaches for President Biden. I'd like to introduce my guests. Good morning, everyone. Uh, with us today is Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning Aloha kakakiaka. Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. We're in Hawaii, remember? I, <laughs> the safest well, to, today I'm not sure where I'm at, but I appreciate you <laughs> reminding me. So thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> hey, um, well, you know, it doesn't take much to uh, bring back the old the old days of uh, the Trump administration when we had caravans of, of immigrants rushing the border and trying to take over America and uh, you know, Donald Trump playing that up as best as he possibly could to, to scare the hearts and minds of American voters. Um, but we do have a, an issue at the border, and um, it seems to be growing. We have over uh, 14,000 uh, unaccompanied minors uh, currently uh, in, in, not in detention, but uh, they're, being, they're being in detention, basically. Um, and they've, they've come here to uh, the United States by themselves, which is a risky thing to do. Jay, what do you believe is the cause all of a sudden of this rush or influx of, of, of unaccompanied minors to America? Uh, two, two thoughts on that. Uh, one is um, that Joe Biden is a nice guy. And uh, he's talking about trying to you know, make immigration better. And he's actually taking steps within his ability to issue executive orders for that purpose. And I think that filters down south and people think, well, uh, maybe the United States is kinder and gentler than it was under Trump. So they head north. That's one way to look at it. The uh, other way to look at it is that the conditions that drove them north in the first place never ended. Uh, their desire to come to the United States never ended. Um, and it's a survival thing. They keep on doing it. Um, but I think, you know, the one thing I want to mention within the allotted time I have is that <clears throat> what, what, what strikes me is that we are in a political civil war. Um, the Republicans and Trump weaponized immigration. They weaponized the Verschluggen wall. Uh, they put, you know, kids in cages. Uh, they took draconian steps, really mean, nasty steps. They made the um, immigration service meaner and far meaner than it needed to be. Um, and, and used it as a political tool. Now, when Biden has, has his hands full with pretty much the same phenomena, um, the Republicans are criticizing him. You know, he's been in office, what, how long? It is, you know, two months. Um, he's been in office only two months, and whatever processes are in play are, are you know, are the extension of what Trump created and allowed and, and fomented in his time in office. And now the Republicans are out there blaming Biden for everything. This is part of the political war. And, and the larger picture is they want to make them look bad. Uh, they want to make them look bad because 2022 is only a couple of years away. And they want to have them for lunch on that election, doing everything they can possibly do. This one is easy. They have no interest in passing an immigration reform bill. He wants to do that. You know they're going to do everything possible to stop it and then make them look bad on that and every other initiative he submits to Congress. Okay, well, two points I want to bring to your attention. And one is, you know, there were some severe hurricanes uh, back in November of 2020, uh, Hurricane Eta and Lata. And uh, they, it, those hurricanes back to back devastated Honduras and a lot of uh, Central American countries. And uh, I don't think those countries have actually recovered. And so not only were a lot uh, displaced and, and lost their homes and, and their crops, but um, it, it devastated the entire area. So that could be part of the reason. But I wanted to ask you with whether or not you thought uh, the executive order of the Dreamer, uh, allowing Dreamers to stay in the country, um, prompted um, parents to basically say to their children, go, get into the country any way you can, because... President Biden has uh, signed this executive order about letting children stay in the country. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that did have a big play to it. So I agree. Um, hey, Winston, playing to uh, uh, Jay's point that the Republicans want to use this as a wedge issue, because if you remember in 2016, it was this very issue that got Donald Trump basically elected was, um, you know, we had porous borders and the Obama administration was allowing rampant um, immigration go, to go unchecked, which wasn't true, by the way. Um, but he was used as a wedge issue. And it seems to me that this will play very well in the 2022 election. And why is that? Well, we have so many people at the border right now that uh, the word has gone out that the Biden administration has let adults go because we have so many people in detention that they have let adults go without any uh, check-in requirements, without any phone numbers or, or instructions on how to report to courts um, when their time comes due. Uh, I, it was, I don't know to what extent that has happened, but that seems to be playing right into the GOP hand to say to um, all Americans, both Democrat and Republicans, see, the Biden administration is like the Obama administration. We're gonna have unchecked immigration and it's going to destroy the, the complex and nature of this country. Your thoughts on, on the GOP and their ability to use this as a wedge issue? Well, no doubt will be used as a wedge issue, but you know, you, you basically, uh, if, I were, if I were living in Honduras or Guatemala, and I had a 16 year old kid and I knew what his prospects were gonna be, I would say, you know what, son? Here's some money, go north, find a coyote and get him across the border right now. We've got a new administration. I mean, I would do it. It's, it's a survival issue, like Jay said. Your chances of either being you know, murdered or, or in, a, in a gang warfare or just a life of, of terrible poverty. And what we really need to do is, is like so many issues, go back to the root cause of this and we need to as a as a great nation we need to look at our in our own hemisphere our own backyard and say what can we do to help these these uh countries that are so close to america raise that they don't want to come to america i mean it may be the promised land in some level but they want to stay home with their friends and families and neighbors what can we do to strengthen their societies what sort of marshall plan can we do for central america so that they don't have this what sort of help can we give with policing and with social services and and healthcare and and um i don't want to say nation building but nation supporting so that we don't have that i mean that's the real issue uh because they people don't want to leave their country by and large but when they're forced to they're forced to and uh now that this these awful awful um unhuman uh, uh, inhumane uh, uh, policies that were enforced over the last four years are gone i can see the appeal so you know also other things about like having to wait in mexico for um permission um you know this is going to require a sustained concentrated focused effort with the leaders of these nations and to and to provide leadership where it doesn't exist we have that joe biden is uh is going calmly and quietly about this there there seem to be building a lot more um, places to receive these kids, but ideally, you shouldn't have to send your kid to America at 16 to escape a life uh, and, and to get to a life just to have a life. But that's the reality that we have. Uh, you know, Winston, the, this morning the news was that uh, he put Kamala in charge of immigration. <clears throat> it means he really cares about it. He knows he has a political problem about it and he wants to do something. But let me, let me take a moment to agree totally with your point about we have um, an obligation, noblesse oblige obligation, uh, to help the, the countries south of us. And, and during the Trump administration, we didn't do anything to help them. Well, uh, I, in, in earlier administrations, we might have done a little. But the bottom line is uh, the U.S., for its own security, uh, should be helping South America, Latin America, every day. Didn't we already decide this one with the Monroe Doctrine saying this is our sphere of influence? Well, if it's our sphere of influence, then let's step up. And that was what, 1814 or something like that? Yes. Or, yeah, right, right, right. So, yeah. but, but ideally, just like with Europe, you want a free, prosperous, democratic, rich, wealthy Europe, just like you, th that's what we did with Europe so that it d didn't fall into w whatever fascism or, or communism. We need the same thing for Latin America. We've just let this languish in our backyard so, uh, uh, for, for 
decades it, and and it's it's not it's not who we 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 can do better than that and we if, if we raise their standard of living where they're at and help them do that i mean it's the marshall plan was not a huge massive expenditure in the scheme of things but it was able to get europe on the right track and i think we yeah. we need to focus on on the problem rather than uh, the 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 brute problems rather than um of course the immediate problem you can't you can't do that without congress you cannot do well, any of this without Congress. Every Congress issue is politically locked up. Yeah, because every of the issue, Republican Jay. Intransigence. Yeah. We're not going to get anywhere on anything. Agreed, Jay. Every issue is tied up, and um, again, it's all about the filibuster. So that's that's a separate topic, and it's one which could take up three shows on whether or not that filibuster goes away or not, or or how it's amended, or or um, how how it's shaped differently. So, all right, thank you, both of you, uh, Cynthia. At, at this point, how has the the Biden administration addressed this crisis at the border? And has the GOP already been able to get a toehold into this issue so they can use it against them? Um, has he responded fast enough? Uh, is it effective enough? It certainly doesn't help when, when reports go out that they're letting um, undocumented people that have flowed into the country just go and let them go. That doesn't help. That doesn't help the, uh, it helps the GOP in their argument and their, their claims, but it certainly doesn't help the Democrats. So your opinion about how the Biden has uh, responded thus far? Well, I don't believe much of anything that the GOP wants to say these days. They have lied so repeatedly over and over and over that I don't believe anything. So if this bit of news about these people being led into the uh, country came from them, I would just- No, it didn't. No, it's- this is real, you know. This is normal news reporting that this actually did occur. So it occurred. I don't know to what degree. I don't think it was massive amounts of um, undocumented individuals that were let free and without any expectation of reporting back, without any paperwork, without any phone number, contact information. But um, it is it is what something has happened, and and I think the GOP will run with it. Yeah, and I still don't know if I believe it completely because the. The official um, uh, thing that the, the Biden administration has put out, and, they, and it was in response to a recent interview by uh, uh, Republican Tennessee Senator Blackburn, where she was on Fox saying that it's all Biden's fault that we have this surge of children. And in reality, right after that on CNN, when they were talking about this, the, the Biden administration put out a re, uh, response saying that the border is not open. She kept claiming that Biden said the border is open. So they put out an official statement saying the border is not open. And they're doing as much as they can to make sure that people don't just come in like that released that way. I wonder about the suspicious between what he's, what Biden is saying in official responses and um, and measures, then, and then what this is. So to, to, they don't fit together, and for me anyway, they don't. Well, I think that's a great point, and I think this is a perfect time for the Biden administration to dispel many of the myths that the GOP win points on. Thank you. And that's where I was going. That is my biggest thing right now. Why isn't the Biden administration, I mean, coming down hard on all these lies and all these misinformation things? It's like they're ignoring it, hoping it will go away. And well, I don't think that's right with this situation. Well, I think the number one thing that the GOP scores on, and based on a, you know, a, a broken myth that's been dispelled decades ago, but they still win points, is the fact that anyone who's undocumented is fully uh, going to gain um, the benefits of the federal government. And what does this say? They can come in here and they can get um, their... Um, you know, their, their benefits of such as uh, welfare and, and uh, SNAP programs and all of those benefits that, uh, you know, anyone who has a green card is eligible for. But they've used that so well in the past to say, see, you're a taxpayer and now you have to fund all these uh, undocumented workers or not workers, but undocumented individuals for all these federal benefits. And it simply is not true. No one gets these benefits. Unless they have, of course, a green, a green card or 
um, I think if they're legally uh, being in, a, in an asylum uh, classification, they may be eligible for some of those benefits. Right, but so the GOP, GOP keeps saying that. One thing I wanted before I get too far away from it, before we all get too far away from it, you guys are talking about how we need to help the other countries so that they don't need to come here, right? Well, I'm not totally sure, and I don't remember all the details of it, but didn't Trump stop one of those programs for that? so that they were help, we were helping those countries and he rolled back all of the aid that we were giving them. Yes, he did, good point. So yeah, I think it's totally true that we do need to fund these places so that they don't need to come here. You know, I think another point is that um, the, the number of personnel hired to um, you know, patrol the border went up in every administration and even the uh, Obama administration uh, went from like, 18,000 to 21,000. And then under Trump, it actually went from 21,000 down to 19,000 employees. So it's, it's odd that, you know, he was, um, this was his soapbox, which gained him, I think, part of the election in 2016. Yet, um, other than building a few miles of a wall, he really did everything he could not to uh, stem the flow. Tim, did you see there was a question? I think it's yes, worth I, asking one of these that. guys. Stephanie, to you. The question is, uh, <clears throat> VP Kamala Harris really has been uh, tasked with dealing with the border crisis. What do you think she can bring to the table that the uh, normal agencies like the Department of Homeland Security or, or the Department of State cannot bring to the table? What special talents will she, will she make a difference? Well, I, I think there've just been so many insightful and uh, creative comments, um, really problem solving, um, advances here expressed on the show so far and I don't need to enumerate all of those we can go back and look at it again but I think that just as with getting Trump off the presidential st uh, stoop stand it uh, will elevate the the uh, interaction and the conversation nationally and internationally some um, especially at the level of fifth grade playground bully stuff. The same thing needs to happen with regard to these issues that we just keep slamming and slamming on, and that's immigration. So if Kamala can bring this kind of insightful, creative, divergent thinking to addressing the, the crisis and the, the issues and identifying the problems and doing some analysis to come up with ways that need to be tried that haven't already just been hammered to death and i she think also, she can, stephanie she can also identify the lies uh, that cynthia was talking about she can separate the wheat from the chaff you know and she's got the power this is the thing about the power so because putting a high level official on this gives it airtime okay so she can get on and upgrade the time covered in the national news but if it's the same old hackneyed these problems same stuff what's the use of it we've all heard it so the american people are concerned about the money that's being spent on this are concerned about our international image are concerned about the blasting up of our values and, uh, and the care of children has been the latest, latest one. So we need to raise the level of the discourse to much more insightful, creative, and constructive, coherent problem solving. We have the capacity to do this. Okay. This is why we were great. So I call on her to use the power to get the attention and to, to get the commission, the committee, whatever, together to let's do some work here. Yeah. And hey, Stephanie, last question on this, this topic for you. Does this sudden um, rush to the, to the U.S. border, I know immigration is part of the Biden agenda. I'm not sure on what priority that was placed. Uh, I think, you know, the election reform, voting reform was uh, certainly high on the list. Uh, also, infrastructure is high on the list. Does this particular issue derail the synergy, the energy, of the Biden administration to get things uh, knocked out in Congress? Well, I think it's a big message that the international community, our fellow border people and south of us, they know our value system better than we do. They're coming here 
for the things that we've forgotten about and the Congress has forgotten about. They're here for that. Okay. And even though you're you're risking coming across that border because you could easily get shot in the head, as all of us can, go into cotton picking fresh foods or wherever. So I think you know they're all operating at this level that that they envision is the United States, and the United States of America needs to work real hard on getting back up there Alrighty. and get in line with them. So yeah, it's it's there, and it it's a reminder and it's a challenge. All righty. Well, hey, thank you, Stephanie. Hey, switching gears, Jay, to you. Uh, I think it was um, Nancy Meyer from The New Yorker uh, wrote an article recently about um, what Cyrus Vance could do to bring down Donald Trump now that he's out of the office as president of the United States. Um, a fascinating article because it goes into depth about who Cyrus Vance is, what his reluctancy has been in the past for prosecution, but also how earnest he is in pursuing some of these charges. What are those charges? Uh, we're looking at undervaluation of assets, and that, that pertains to bank fraud. We're looking at fraud issues with insurance companies. We're looking at, um, um, excuse me, I said undervaluating assets. I meant overvaluating assets for banks, yet undervaluating assets for the IRS in which he pays taxes. We're looking at the Stormy Daniel payments. We're looking at the Carol Madugo payments. We're looking at uh, his involvement with Deutsche Bank. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of things that Cyrus Vance could possibly look into. Uh, your thoughts about this article and, and what chances are, will they be successful in any kind of prosecution uh, of Donald Trump or, or an indictment pending? Well, it was encouraging to read the article. Um, it, it was in the uh, New Yorker uh, last edition. And it was quite, it was really a masterful piece of work uh, examining what the charges were, who Cyrus Vance is, uh, what could, what should happen with respect to all of these, um, um, you know, misdeeds of his, uh, many of which are, in fact, criminal. I think uh, I was left with, um, you know, one thing that, that I think has to be mentioned is that Cyrus Vance is leaving his office. He's retiring at the end of the year. This only came out within the last few weeks, as I understand it. And he's, he's probably leaving it to this guy, Pomerantz. Right. Uh, Pomerantz was hired as an expert in, in, uh, in organized crime cases. And he's a real sophisticated, hard-nosed uh, uh, litigator because he's been on both sides of the issue and especially a prosecutor. So in a, in a way, Pomerantz is going to be better than Cyrus Vance. Um, the, the article showed you Cyrus Vance's political backgrounds, his connection with the elite, elite political Operate, operatives in New York. Um, it did not mention, however, the Abacus Federal Savings and Loan case. I don't know if you guys ever knew about that. Um, this happened oh, five or six years ago. And Cyrus, uh, it was a, a fallout from the 2008 um, economic crisis. And he only went after one company. And it was a federal uh, savings and bank called Abacus Savings and Bank federal savings in Chinatown, New York. <clears throat> it was a small family operation. Uh, everybody in the bank was a member of one Chinese family in Chinatown. And when it, he went after them with tongs, hammer and tongs, then they resisted and they fought back. And they were, you know, it was David and Goliath kind of saying, and they beat him. And, and the big question at the end of the day is two questions is why did he go after only one defendant? And it was, by the way, it was an unrelated issue. It was one of the employees of the bank, you know, misrepresented something. And it was small potatoes. It was really small potatoes. It had nothing to do with the crisis of 2008. And there was Cyrus spending the taxpayers' money, chasing this, this Asian family around for years. And he beat them. So Cyrus is not perfect, okay? He's not perfect for the, uh, for the case. And he's not perfect for leaving at a time when he could stay. He's popular. Everybody is rooting for him, and he's leaving. Is he going to get uh, Alan Weisselberg to flip over on Donald Trump? Donald Trump's confidant for 30, 40 years. Uh, is he going to get that close relationship to, um, to testify against Donald Trump? Well, I don't think we're going to see much from actually from Cyrus Vance in the next... Uh, 
what, nine months, because at the end of the year, he's gone, and it's going to be Pomerantz instead. But yes, um, Weisselberg is sitting pretty for a flip. Why? Because he's got no protection from Trump. Trump cannot help him. Um, Trump can't pardon him. Uh, it's a state crime, not a federal crime. Uh, it's a perfect opportunity for a good prosecutor to, to flip Weisselberg. And if he does, I mean, the, the consensus among prosecutors is that is the end of Trump. Uh, Trump will be found guilty not only on the things we know, but on so many things included in the documents from, what is it, Mazars and Deutsche Bank and you know, various other things that have not come public yet that are as bad or worse. Weisselberg can, Weisselberg can tell us all. And that, if he flips, it will be the end of Trump. If he doesn't okay, flip, well, he's going to go to jail. Yeah, let me go to, let me go to Winston on a, to follow up on that point. If, if uh, the, um, excuse me, the New York Southern District of Manhattan is successful of bringing an indictment against Donald Trump, Winston, what will that do to this country? What will that do with the 74 million uh, voters that voted for Donald Trump? And how will it impact uh, the 22 election and um, furthering the, the divide up, up between Americans? Is it going to be the witch hunt that Donald Trump says it will be? Uh, will that further um, bring us down and, and put us into a state where nothing's getting done? Uh, I, I just to, it's a great article in the New Yorker. It came out uh, 22nd of March. Uh, as just to quote from it, it says, Vance's office could well be the only operable break on Trump's remarkable record of impunity. He has survived two impeachments, the investigation by the special counsel, Robert Mueller, half a dozen bankruptcies, 26 accusations of sexual misconduct, and an estimated 4,000 lawsuits. And his successor, President Joe Biden, so far seems to prefer that the Department of Justice simply turn the page. As a result, the contest between Vance and Trump is much more about uh, than a, uh, much more than about a financial investigation. It's a stress test of the American justice system. Trump is a man who's gotten away with everything in his life. He's an affront to the rule of law, to all law-abiding citizens, is the quote from George Conway, Kellyanne's husband. Um, so he says, in office, Trump often treated law as a political weapon, using the Justice Department as a tool for treating enemies. Now he's pitted against a DA who regards the law as, a political, as the politically blind foundation of democracy. As Conway put it, for Trump, the law is a cudgel. For Vance, it's what holds us together as a civilization. And so he says, and that's why people uh, who thumb their noses at it have to be prosecuted. And if they aren't, you're taking a big step towards a world where that's acceptable. And I think that's what we've dealt with the last four years. So 4,000 lawsuits, two impeachments, special investigation, Donald Trump will come out of it unscathed. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, his base, whatever's left, will hem and haw and say it's so terrible and blah, blah. But right. at the end of the day, he's not going to be in prison. He's, he may be found guilty, but um, it'll probably be like the article suggests, something more like um, Berscaloni, where he had to do community service, which whatever that was, and then he got real. A neon vest along the highway. Okay, thank you, yes. Winston. <laughs> Hey, yeah. um, Cynthia, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think Donald Trump is going to be indicted? And if so, what would happen if he, if he went to jail? Uh, other countries, um, France and, and, and Winston just referred to Italy, they've thrown their former prime ministers, and um, especially in France, I mean, they've been convicted. Uh, Sarkozy's been convicted. Uh, Jacques Chirac was convicted. And the bottom line is, uh, what if Donald Trump is convicted? Um, we can only hope and pray, right, um, that he will be. Because like Winston read from this article, if we let him off the hook, not only will we might be stuck with him again, but we'll be stuck with somebody that's just like him and possibly smarter, which would be even more dangerous. And he might be, you know, and we, we always talk about Trump being so dumb and he may be dumb about some things, but he's incredibly crafty and smart in those ways. In, I mean, he's a, a gifted con man his whole life. That's what he's done. So <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully he will. Um, I'm glad 
that they've changed. Um, the critics assert that um, that Vance, um, he was, let's see, I'm going to read it from the article so I don't get it wrong. Critic, okay, we're, we're running out of time, but um, go okay. ahead. He has frequently retweeted, retreated when faced with rich and powerful criminal targets. Notably, in 2012, he dropped a case involving two of Trump's children. So I'm glad Vance is leaving. At first I thought, oh, we don't really need to be changing in the middle of all this. And then I read this article. And well, I Mark, Mark about Pomeroy is a pit bull, uh, certainly much more of a pit bull than Cyrus Vance. So I, I would agree with that statement. Glad, and I have more hope now that after reading this article, I really yeah. recommend to everyone because it's a little long, but I, I really stress that you guys- no, It's a great article and I'm, I'm glad that um, it was brought to our attention. Yeah. Okay, hey, we've got to run out of time, but Stephanie, it's been a tumultuous week so far. Um, your, your thoughts about this week and where we move from here? Well, I certainly hope, as I tried to interrupt and ask Jay earlier, sorry about that, but I was so um, <laughs> motivated because does Weisselberg have protection? Because already Biden has admitted that this, is, this guy can kill. I mean, this is a Putin-esque uh, person we Good have. Good point. Uh, and so is, is Weisselberg, um, do we know anything? Or maybe they're not talking, you know, you assume that, oh, the FBI or whoever is doing their duty, but are they? This man needs protection. In fact, they just ought to take him away somewhere. I, so, I, I think your, your point's right on because it's like the, uh, the untouchables. Elliot Ness got a hold of the, the accountant against uh, Capone and they had to lock him away so he wouldn't be bumped off. It's a done deal if he has one uh, uh, centimeter of option. And, uh, and Trump does. So he knows to push it to the limits. He knows when to fold them and he knows when to hold them in our system, which is so uh, admired because it is so fair and it is the rule of law. It gives every kind of opportunity for, to, for defense. And he takes that ball and runs with it in a way to make it advantageous for the, the drop dead guilty. So he knows how to do all that. He's been doing it since he was a kid. And there's still the issue of the older brother that hasn't been resolved. Nobody seems to be too interested in that. But I, I, don't, I don't put anything past him. And I hope Alrighty. that Weisselberg is in good shape. On, in OK, this. well, we've run way over time, but I can't let the show end without getting your last words. Uh, very briefly, uh, Jay, to you, last words. Yeah, this is a stress test, just as Winston has read from the article of the American justice system. Um, and as Cynthia has uh, imparted, you know, there's a fair chance that, and, and for that matter, Stephanie, it's a fair chance that Trump will use all the tools in his kit bag, including really some nefarious things, as he has in the past, and, and somehow escape. Um, and this will be a failure of the stress test. Um, we have to watch this very carefully because it's not just what happens to Trump, it's how the country, and as Stephanie says, it's how the world thinks of us. This is the acid test coming up now. It may seem like a bunch of uh, you know financial issues, boring, boring, but it's much, much more than that. Uh, also, I wanna tell you that tomorrow on America Finding Its Way, we're gonna talk about the Second Amendment uh, among other things, I'm going to talk about um, all the things that flow out of that. Uh, so uh, stop by at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Jay. Winston, your last words? I hope we cover Ruth Marcus's uh, column that just talked about uh, the filibuster and getting rid of it or not getting rid of it as well. What on... publication? It came out in the Star Advertiser, but she's from the Washington Post. I think she had some pretty salient points um, that sort of summarized uh, everything. And uh, we are, are we facing a stress test? Yes. It, let's let the process unfold. They have this, these, these hard drives and, and the Deutsche Banks and all the files, millions of pages in double lockdown gold foil protected <laughs> yeah. room so let's find out what happens vault get the information not room out vault there, a vault and <laughs> yeah. let's see what happens and all right and as information percolates out maybe people can decide okay i'm gonna choose another team okay thank you winston hey cynthia your last brief words i think that it is important um there was an nbc news special that came out with julia ainsley jacob soberoff and laura strickler and these three people have been 
involved in dealing with the border crisis since it first started during the Trump administration. And they have put out an article saying that um, they were that the Biden administration officials say that Trump officials delayed action on child migrant surge. In early December, the Biden transition team and career government officials started sounding the alarm on the need to increase shelter space because they knew they were coming. So, um, okay, well, it didn't catch the news, you know, the media, it was focused on other issues, obviously, because uh, we didn't catch a lot of that. Now it seems like it uh, suddenly happened and it looks like it's Biden's, it's Biden's um, responsibility. Like, so, well, today Biden and his administration, the delegation is inside those facilities, in the CBP one, because, you know, half of the kids are in a DHS run uh, one and a facility, and then the other kids are in a CBP facility. So right, right. everybody into DHS, no more private facilities. That's the most important part is that there's no more private run facilities. Good point, all right. Wow, we've covered a lot in a short time. So uh, that's our show for this week. I need to say thank you. Wait, wait, wait Tim, you. wait, wait, wait. Yes. I gotta correct one thing, it's really important. Go ahead. The Monroe Doctrine. 1823. Uh, that's right, he um, knew. I meant to say something. <laughs> Google it folks, educate I'm yourself. Glad, I'm glad we're all about making sure our facts are correct. And we're live fact checking speak, right here on and Think Speaking Tech. of facts, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. That's a fact. <laughs> so I want to say thank you for Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and Stephanie Dalton. Thank you, one and all, for attending What Now America. Join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you then. Aloha. <laughs>